Awesome. Um, so, <laughs> first, how, how, how'd you find out about this, the, the apprenticeship? Uh, well, I, I learned about open source ecology, like, I think like a couple months ago mm-hmm. from your website. And I, I think I was searching up like how to make a 3D printer, or it, it, I was tra- searching up how to make some tool, and that's how I found open source ecology. And then I just like periodically would check the website yeah. and see what you guys were up to. Yeah. Are you on the OSC mail, the newsletter, or not really? Um, you can sign up, sign up for that later. But um, I didn't think so. Okay. Um, so yeah, so about collaborative development, um, you mentioned about uh, affordable housing that sh- that you would make. Are you interested in actually building a house? So you talked about indie game developers. You're an indie game developer yourself. Yeah. Is that is that what you actually do for a living right now? Well, um, mainly what I do is I freelance uh, mm-hmm. and I use Upwork right now. Mm-hmm. And that's mainly to give myself like the financial room to mm-hmm. work on my own projects. Mm-hmm. And before that, I worked in, in AAA full time uh, for like ten months. AAA. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about your goals um, regarding. So the part that's interesting to you, you actually see yourself building the houses as a as a result of this program. Or is it more? I, I would. I I love to. I love to build houses. So I think, like, um, you know, independent game developers um, are very creative people, and I think that they could build um, very like um, artistic communities. Mm-hmm. And mostly, like, game developers live in cities, and mm-hmm. that's one of the big issues why housing is affordable. Mm-hmm. So it would be nice to have a way to develop games near a city, um, but not necessarily in the city. Um, so, so yeah, that would be ideal for me is to have like a open source village near an existing city mm-hmm. that was more affordable and, and however I can help um, get there. Um, I, I, I would love to, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I, and again, like, I'm an entrepreneur. I just happen to do game development right now. <sighs> how do you? Um, what makes you an entrepreneur? How how do you make that? <clears throat> yeah, tell me more about that. Uh, I um, I don't know if there's a qualification, but I browse Hacker News a lot. <laughs> and I I've been reading like Peter Thiel, and uh, I follow a lot of the Silicon Valley um, mm-hmm. like thought leaders. Yeah. Um. um have you started any ventures? So you you do the game game development that's on the side, but but freelancing and freelancing on what? What what do you typically freelance on? I I do freelance. Um, I use a like a, a gig platform called Upwork. Yeah, I know that. And I work in Unreal Engine, helping okay. um, whoever wants build uh, either like games or game related projects. Yeah, and a lot of that. With, like uh, the projects that I work on are confidential. Mm-hmm. Um, I've also like I've also tried to start some like small businesses around games. Like I've worked on little mobile games and published them. And when I was younger, I tried to make a flash gaming website, but I had bad timing because that was right as flash games started to kind of um, uh, be replaced by like the Steam marketplace, and and so. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in um, entrepreneurship around games and technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, Unreal Engine, is that any of it open source or is that all proprietary? The engine is open source. You can um, you know, download it, modify the code, um, submit up modifications, but there is like a 5% royalty on any projects making more than a million. And so, so like Epic is is pretty lenient, a lot more than other companies. Um, so it's kind of in the realm of like, it's um, it's free, but it has a cost. It's open, but it has a cost. So it's not a. <clears throat> I'm not sure. Is that what's the license on it? Do they have a license? I I think it's a custom one. 
It's a custom and license. it's basically like you can't distribute um, tools made from Unreal Engine outside of the market Unreal Engine marketplace, um, and, and then they they have the royalty on yeah. uh, your games. It's not not exactly open source according to the definition, but open the the source code is open. It doesn't mean it actually follows the open source definition. The even if the right, source right, code and is open. but th there are other game engines that are more open, like Godot, Godot. Uh, for example. Which um, I, don't, I don't know. If, I think Godot is an MIT license. Yeah, have um, you ever looked into doing work with that? Or yeah, I've I've made games in Godot, and I've yeah. worked also with like GD Native. Uh, so I've done like custom. Um, C++ working good. Uh, the problem is, I, I don't think like Godot can, is like competitive with Unity or Unreal Engine currently. It just can't do as much, nearly as much. It is, exactly. There's not a lot of examples of um, commercially successful games made with Godot mm -hmm. compared to something with like Unity. And you know, Unity has mm -hmm. like very prominent developers making very successful games. Mm -hmm. And Unreal Engine has got a lot of successful games? Yeah. But Unreal more for larger projects. For Godot, do you think you could do something comparable to, uh, what do you call it? What's the, th what's the game where you build, build things? Like Minecraft? Minecraft. Can you do a Minecraft-like game within Godot? Well, could I do it, or could someone theoretically could do it? Someone theoretically do it. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. Um, the problem is like the problems are like how long will it take you? Um, you know, Minecraft was originally made in Java, mm -hmm. uh, so I I'm sure you could make Minecraft in 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 Godot. Um, some of the problems with Godot though are like they use a custom scripting language called um, GD Script, which personally I'm not a fan of because. It, it's not a like uh, it's not a programming language that is independent from the engine, mm. and some of the types bindings are not like first class citizens, and it, there's a lot of friction when trying to use them. So it might you could build it in Godot, but more realistically, if you're going to build um, like a voxel based game, it'd be better to just use C plus plus and an entity component system, um, like just running frameworks on GitHub might get you there faster. First class citizen, is that a, <clears throat> that's just saying, is that just a name for good or is that a technical term? It, for, to me, that just means that um, the engine is designed to support it um, like just as well as like t to the maximum degree possible, or not just support it, but the workflows are efficient. Mm -hmm. If something takes a long time to do, yeah. it doesn't matter if you can do it because it, it just takes yeah, too long. Just, I see. So it's more the workflow efficiency, not what you can do. Well, that translates to everything. It's like the efficiency in our builds. If it took us forever to build our house, we wouldn't have a product that can be built in five days. And it's a complete different story, right? So I, if I use that metaphor, then I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you ever considered getting land outside of the city or like on the city outskirts and actually doing this? Like, are you actually looking into that or? Yeah, I, I mean, I, um, I thought like about all sorts of different types of solutions. I'm very interested in like seasteading mm -hmm. and like consider that as like an avenue to, to, to develop communities. And then uh, like I've, I've looked at land prices and Work I think what? like land and, and what? I just like look at like land, oh, land prices. prices look at like, land prices. Think about um, like like where and how and when this this will be possible. Yeah, what kind of land prices are you looking at? Like, and what size size scale of land? Oh, no, no, I haven't done a, like a big technical study on it, so I'm not actually sure of like the the feasibility of something like this. Uh, like, for example, like mainly, I think, I think the big problem with with this is that land. The near, closer you get to cities, yeah. the more expensive land gets, sure. and, and and it's a particularly um, like villainous problem because you have a city like Austin, Texas, 
which is where game developers want to live. And you have like, you know, real estate prices, you know, go to the roof because Apple's building like a billion dollar facility. Tons of people are moving there. And so the places where game developers want to live are also the most expensive places. Right. And of course you can build in the middle of nowhere, uh, but the question is, can you get the community? Can you build a community to do that? Uh, would you s see that as, po as possible? So you, you build, you, now you have the capacity to build, then can you attract the people to it because you, you can build a place? I, I think it's possible. I think it would require the right approach. And I think bootstrapping is one way to get there. I think, I think as soon as you can develop a successful um, game, like inside of like a game village or whatever, then that that can scale. Because the revenue from that means that you can support more people, you can make other villages, you can expand your village. Yeah. Is that the model you would see? Like, okay, let's get the product in this village. Hey, we're going to work on this together, uh, live at low cost, and then we'll make it happen, and that's a way to scale it. That's kind of how you're looking at it. Yeah, I think that's like a, I think that's kind of a compelling adventure for people is is uh, and you know there's a whole thing with like crunch is where you know you don't want to be working on a game all hours so in some sense having like the ability to spend some time farming or building buildings like yeah. is almost like a relaxing way um, to and, and, and like something you can spend time doing while you think about games or like it's um, I, I think that would be um, that would be a really like it would be motivating for game development it, or, or inspiring because I guess a lot of game developers just get inspiration from nature or other people of course of course I mean uh, if we're if we're integrated as people we, we get a connection to nature that's just part of it um, but it's interesting what you're saying about way to you get a community of people working on a product together because that's the exact model of what we're saying okay let's let's create these communities and now we're talking about various hardware like a house or anything in the mainstream economy that we can develop and, and we've got a low cost basically a, a development model <clears throat> that can be funded so the idea is actually the same except you're talking about a game well cool we're talking about a product it could be a digital product like the and, and at the end of the day, digital becomes physical in some way when you go into the, like the housing 2.0 model where if you have a full, complete digital model, um, one, you can do digital fabrication on it, you can do automation on it, but the, the next thing is uh, I want to see the game where people are designing the real things within the game. That's what I want to see. Have that you, was really exciting. I mean, have you thought about that? That part? I mean, if you think of I think like Minecraft really it was the first I guess like architecture breakthrough right because people could build a house people can build a house in Minecraft yeah. in five minutes and you know there's no need to like buy land you just walk out into nature and here's here's like chunks of terrain yeah. and resources yeah absolutely. so yeah there I, there's definitely a positive feedback loop of um, people creating architecture in digital worlds and then that um, being inspiration for the real world. Yeah, um, let me show you. I put some notes on the wiki regarding uh, OSC game. There's, I'll take a look at that. I don't know how much there is on that page. But the concept there was, so, so yeah, Minecraft actually does that, except it's not, there's a, very important distinction is what you're putting into that game buildable because what minecraft does is not it's just blocks of crazy stuff oh sorry you cut let me uh, get this voice out here sorry can you say that again oh for some reason i don't know what happened there but i'm not hearing you is that my side or on your side um Yes, now that's good. That's good. Sorry, so what'd you say?
Okay, so let's let's hit what you just said right now, and that's a big point. Yeah, of course you can do it, but once again, like you mentioned with the metaphor of the game, if it's not if it's not efficient, it doesn't matter because nobody's going to do it, and the cost is going to be high. So that's what we mean, and, and that's an important thing to understand about the CD home, which most people don't understand. They just think that oh yeah, you got a design, you can build it. The way we can build our our home at factors less cost than anyone else is because we take very very explicit detail to how buildable it is what materials you use what process goes into it and then that can explode like wildfire because it's the most efficient and best design that with the open source method you continue to develop it until it's a robust thing that can that can scale quite a bit so that that's that very important distinction and if you were to design a game that does that you would have to put in like like take the existing modules that we have say even on a CD home and as long as you're using something that's already pre-engineered then multiple people working on that within a game environment can actually add tremendous value so imagine now so we've got CAD right computer-aided design which is not immersive you're you're kind of doing it you can do collaborative workflows by div dividing the problem into many parts but what if you're actually in there you're the guy within a video game environment a virtual environment and you're actually taking those real modules and assembling that together with a team you know like that that kind of a thing that could be I think that way if that someone does that then we will have created a collaborative a real technical collaborative development platform that makes the design of a new house actually possible because right now we have the building blocks we've developed completely the or are still working on the complete details for the the one model but then think about all the kinds of other variations that are possible from the building block approach right so um, a tool like this would be an amazing value add to the ability of a person to build a house because what you can not only do is one you can design make the actual design happen and it's realistic because you're using realistic modules that are buildable as well and engineered so you're already passing engineering codes and stuff like that and the workflows of people how they build it together you can actually practice that so when you go on into a real swarm build with OSE you actually got virtual practice on how to do it if the game actually embodies those elements so I think there's huge huge potential of crowd collaborative design that comes through the virtual environments that would be that would be interesting uh, just to you know expand the index of possible possibilities of what's what's doable when you start combining the the physical world with a game world yeah uh, not much just a little bit we, we use that a little bit mm-hmm Yep. Mm hmm Well, it's the same thing. You, like CAD, the free CAD, it's the same thing, except Blender's got more functionality on doing things like renders and other things it operates in a different platform is completely different but the functionality is you can say it's <coughs> somewhat similar uh, and then again because FreeCAD is open source you can extend it to to do all these kinds of additional features that Blender has and in a limit <laughs> it's almost like you can have all the functionality in one platform versus the other like for example Blender right now is getting into building information modeling so it's getting into this architecture capacity for doing design like you would typically do in CAD um, but the, mi the thing missing from Blender would be then the, the ability of people actually to collaborate over the internet because I don't think there's much in Blender I'm not sure oh does it wow okay cool maybe it has maybe that's the best place to start and then that would be interesting yeah so Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Why are, why are shaders so important? Because they're a critical element of any any game engine. Okay. Is shading, the critical aspect of shading, is that the fact of how realistic it looks, like in, a, in the game, that it looks like a real environment? Or what's, what's the key to shading? What's, what's the importance? What does that allow you to do? Sounds like some some object recognition stuff and like say you're the thing that comes to my mind is like imagine we had the capacity of a game engine to do this you scan our site so we've got our site here and uh, then we can model the site we can drive our tractors I'm on a computer here it's my control room with a few monitors and I'm driving the tractor around we're mm -hmm. say it again we're no I want that because I want to be here instead of getting abused in the field sitting on a tractor building a foundation I want to be sitting right here and watching doing that from my control room it's completely doable and not so hard if you've got internet uh, the, but there's some more like so, so say like easy implementation of that you've got a camera on the on a tractor and I've got the remote control interface on my computer here and I could actually be seeing what happens there uh, but then if you could also uh, do more stuff like if you have a full digital model of the site you can pre-program this tractor to do do the task you want if you had that so I mean I don't think this is like I think this is going to become obvious you know it's pretty soon in the next few years in the future of computer capacity it's not there yet but I think it would be pretty compelling to do something like that like right now thing that we can do immediately is just the joystick version of the tractor uh, where we can control it out in a field just with a joystick. Next level would be, okay, now I control control through my computer and my computer interface that's connected. Um, somewhat low-hanging fruit. Yeah, and then add that into a game engine so people can do that in a game environment and involve remote collaborators doing that. Actually, uh, you know, imagine people within a game... Check this out. Like, imagine people within a game actually doing the build and because it com corresponds to a digital model, they're actually programming the, <laughs> the real event to happen. Imagine that. That would be just awesome. So that's how I see uh, uh, things like the virtual and, and real coming together for where the, the game people are now doing like absolutely productive work that's changing the environment and regenerating the world, you know? That would be pretty exciting. That's that's there's potential there.
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's the ethics, I mean of course you'd have to start with the OSE filter, we don't kill, we bring life and regeneration to the world, and start with some basic ethics, which is what we, we talk a bit, bit about ethics, like as in, as in creating the next ethical economy, the open source economy, one that cr takes care of everybody, and you have to filter it through that, and then you write the rules by which you operate are completely different, You're, it's not a shoot 'em up game, it's a create game, and all of that yeah yeah and that's why the programmer needs to expand their consciousness to 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 understand more than programming and the fact that programming is related to the entire world that's the whole problem with the world right now we learn one discipline and if we do not recognize how it connects to everything else, nature and human, then we're just c causing damage. That's the current operating system of the world. Absolutely. Because what, you, what you'll notice is that once you learn a discipline, you get mastery in that, but you approach it from a generalist perspective then you see the next discipline is so much faster to learn and before you know it you're the renaissance person that's at least my mental model of human capacity uh, and it's it's really up to a person's uh, mental model form formation to see whether they subscribe to that now in our program our goal is to cultivate to expand people's mindset to say well first of all it's, it is possible um, and just think about what happens right now. Right now we're spending all this time just to get into a box. I've done that. I got a PhD in physics and I discovered I was useless. And then uh, what if you were actually studying very explicitly more of the connections of how everything is related? Like I can tell you from my experience, my experience leads me to, to say that the answer to your question is absolutely yes because I just look back at these crazy theoretical or like things that I was studying that I had no idea what they correspond to in real life yet I was forced to learn that it was part of the system and it, what if I were learning instead a different set of knowledge so it would be much broader and if it's broader as I mentioned about that the idea of creating genius is that once you see enough patterns among different disciplines you see that you can translate the pattern from one discipline to the next and learn faster that's the idea of collaborative creation of genius like the idea of that we can be much smarter than we are i believe the natural state of the world is there's a bunch of geniuses in the world i think the way that education happens today is we we, we reduce and box people to these very narrow narrow areas uh, and now you have ai and computer technology which allows you to for, for extremely rapid learning, augmented reality learning, video games that now could serve to educate, not entertain, or both. You know, we have s the tool set that we have right now for rapid, rapid learning, just the internet, <laughs> right? Start with the internet. We've got the, di the digital revolution since a decade or two. So now, pending our ability to actually process that info, um, we can be doing way better than at any time in history. That's, that's my opinion on the topic. Uh, but there's also abuse, a lot of abuse of that right now, that a lot of the, there's a lot of spam out there, a lot of intentional confusion and all of that. So we have to be able to create mechanisms that distill wisdom and knowledge from all the chaff. Um, yeah.
Oh, of course. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and in uh, futurist speak, that's the good AI versus bad AI, evil AI. I mean, we can create, it's like, just like at all times in history, we can choose to to allocate our energy to, to life or death. I mean, creation or, you know, the good old fight of good versus evil and Star Wars and all of that. It's, that battle rages today. Uh, we have tools to either destroy ourselves or to, to make us make us sublime. Uh, the choice is ours. Uh, the problem is that most people don't don't understand that we have that choice. That's that's kind of where in our work that we talk a lot about it. We have the complete choice to do that. Uh, when people learn how to build things physically, they get super empowered to say that Wow, uh, I didn't know I had this power. So yeah. But but I think anybody can agree that it can be better than it is today. We can always improve, right? So uh, there's possibilities of what can happen in the future. And it does like the uh, yes, I agree. The men the current mental model, everything is about consumerism. That's why we're saying, okay, let's create the next economy, the next paradigm, starting with collaborative, not proprietary. Collaborative and open, transparent, as opposed to exclusive and all that other stuff. Like, for example, with patents or education, the way it goes, like you know, like you're asking, can we do better? Well, think about school. In school, you don't learn the top stuff in school ever. You learn the second best because all the best stuff is proprietary. It's 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 an insidious. That's a generalization. But it's absolutely true in engineering. I don't. I didn't learn any of the stuff that I know now from school. I learned a bunch of detailed stuff that uh, we did not share with others. I wasn't able to talk openly to other groups when I was in my PhD program. Someone who thinks right now that we're collaborative and learning is efficient and that innovation exists and is rapid, in my view, is very much mistaken. We're in a stone age of innovation. <laughs> we don't collaborate. And that's the whole, you know, you're making me say, that. this is a good po point to say this. Um, this, is, this is exactly what we're trying to counteract with the open source collaborative economy where it's collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. That's not where we're at. We are very far from it in the mental models of people. I feel the, the main block too the open source culture and open source world is um, where people think, col first of all, people think collaboration already exists, so they don't think it's an issue. It, I don't think it exists. It's very limited. And a lot of people don't. Okay. Uh, an immediate thing that comes to mind is there would be no patents. All information would be shared openly so that anyone can replicate it. Just like right now with COVID, there, the vaccine wasn't, was, was already there, but Bangladesh and other countries, they can't get it because it's proprietary and they can't produce it. Is that efficient and collaborative? That's a clear example of that. Everything that's state of art right now is proprietary. Imagine the world of open source computer chips where you can actually increase innovation on that. Of course, we've got Moore's Law and crazy stuff happening there, but um, I don't think it's as good as it could be. And, and people are certainly working on open source open source solutions, even on uh, the microchips. You know, one of our friends is working on 180 nanometer scale integrated circuits that are completely designed in open source software. Um, so that's all doable. But uh, if we think that innovation is rapid today, no, it's, I don't think so. Uh, so start with... Um, a patent system where no companies are all collaborating to make the first best product is there a best product is okay so let's take the the leader of the world let's say like apple they're considered a pretty good company right are their products the best can they be better yeah that's what i'm talking about it's like they absolutely can be better so why aren't we collaborating to make that happen 
let's let's have all the 10 or 100 companies that are in the same space work together and we actually make make the best product like for example in a world of mechanics you'll you'll hear all the engine heads saying that there is no perfect diesel engine as an example it's true there isn't they all have some really crappy features about them and that's why there's all these camps like oh i really love this engine or, or i really love this engine you, you get all these cults and why are they not actually all working together to make one that's actually good that actually huh well there you go so so exactly so this metaphor applies in all disciplines so i'm trying to just tell you that yeah uh, collaboration is limited it's not where it could be and that's that's why we think w our work can ch cause a lot of change because we're saying okay let's people let's let's grow up here let's collaborate let's finally start collaborating there's big issues in the world let's work on them collaboratively uh, let's learn that yeah there are issues first of all and we have the power to change them right now and we could be doing it when we don't think we have to do it alone when we actually say okay now here's the power of the crowds here's incentives that actually promote solutions than than creating more problems so I, I think a lot of people are pretty depressed these days that there are no solutions but that's it's just the current indoctrination there's a lot of political division lots of lots of issues but yeah we do have the choices yeah yep yep yeah yeah absolutely yeah <clears throat> you have to bootstrap it or earn it somehow like uh, you can start by saying well why is why is land so expensive in the first place well it's once again part of the economic system of how that works there's a lot of speculation but you actually can there's in America we actually are are in a pretty good position because if you if you're just not addicted to being like in a in a hot spot you can get land pretty cheap here in fact you can get free land there's towns in this country that are giving away f land for free so you can build a house there uh, because they don't have an economy they want a tax base so in this country actually it's quite good as long as you have the capacity to not depend on uh, all the things that a city provides uh, so you'd have to create your own infrastructure or be a teleworker a teleworker right now can house themselves anywhere right so there's that but how do you do it yeah there's real real issues there so so we can talk about uh, a, a big issue of improving land access right that's a world issue that's a definitely a pressing world issue uh, there's definitely like with the housing what we ran into is that we've observed that pe the houses are quite expensive because people want to pay a lot but by getting into debt so it's not a good thing but the developers can typically sell for a huge price and the land can be super expensive because people are in a mad need of it they're desperate to, to get it and they have to do it um, how do you solve it part of our solution is like we'll de de deliberately be selling our houses at lower cost than anyone else because one we're more efficient so we can drop the price some by be becoming more efficient what we can do is snap up land parcels like if you talk about it we're actually asked you what scale of land are you looking at my scale here is a thousand acres it's not that's not what we have here but I'm seeing like okay imagine a thousand acres well you're talking about a million dollars that's what one acre would cost in in LA <laughs> but you can get a thousand acres for the set for the same price elsewhere and if you have the technology and know-how to regenerate it you can make it into a paradise anywhere take, take a, a chunk, chunk of, of desert, desert which, which used to be lush, lush forest, forest anyway <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's ways to do it, it. Oh yeah. You need some skills. Yes, that is the limiting part. That's exactly what we're trying to address with the uh, the the work that we're teaching. So yeah, we we start out here like that. 
Um, we found that nobody has the skills to manage or be a steward or have the diverse skill set because as we discussed, the education makes us this narrow tool that fits into the system. Uh, so you have to broaden people's education, train them up to become builders and creators, not consumers. And then it's going to be much easier. But that's the missing part. There's very few people like that. And that's exactly the reason why we're starting the OSC apprenticeship because very few people like that exist. And there's a lot of people that have the ideology, but you get them out into a plot of land, they wouldn't know what to do. They're, they're not prepared. I was like that too. I thought I knew everything. I read all the books. When I was in grad school, I read all the books. I read everything on the regenerative development, appropriate technology, environment, and social issues and all that. And then I got onto a piece of land and I got my ass kicked. <laughs> but re reality is different. <laughs> so, uh, that's the stuff we've, I've been learning for a couple of decades or, t you know, since 2004 when I got out of school. And um, that's what I'm bringing to the world right now. My hard learnings <laughs> so that you can learn. Like I'm saying that um, in six months you can get to learn to design and build just about anything. Um, I don't think it's that hard. I, uh, you can get quite good. You can get to, like I could pretty much guarantee, like, if I can design certain things, I feel like I'm a master designer or builder. Um, I feel I can do, I mean, I can take anything and pretty much design it from scratch. Um, a lot of different things, a lot of different areas. I feel a person that goes through the program, if you practice that for the hundreds of hours that are offered in the program, you'll probably be able to do between 80 and 99% of what I can do. Um, because it takes a lot of time to do it first, but if you teach it in the right way, I think it's doable. Like right now, uh, people that learn FreeCAD, we've had a number of people learn it, learn the basic skill set in under one hour. It's all about effective learning and teaching. Uh, and if you have that integrated approach, it's, it's rapid learning. We talk a lot of, you heard maybe in a video, rapid learning, collaborative creation of genius. That's for real. Uh, but it's all about us teaching each other. Say it again. Well, for example, uh, we have a few data points where several people who've done the FreeCAD exercise have done that in one under one hour. So that's a quantitative statement that says, okay, X people can, when I went to Spain to do a workshop, four out of, I think, 10 people or so learned to do that basic workflow in FreeCAD in, in the one hour lesson that I gave. So there's some data there. Whereas the other data point is, how long does it typically take for you to learn another CAD package or just to learn CAD in general. Um, typically it might be longer, but yes, you, I mean, we don't have a lot of data. It's like, no, that's a full-time study. That's, you know, write a paper on it, right? Uh, but you can act, and the, we'd like to do that, get as much data as possible. The, the, the feedback loops are a critical aspect of our work. How do we uh, capture this data to show, okay, you can learn to design just about anything in this basic workflow in one hour. That's a data point. Uh, if you have a big pool of people, like say 10,000 people that did it, that makes a compelling story. We can say, hey, we taught hundreds and thousands of people to do this in short time. So can you, and here's the video you watch and the lessons that we've developed by understanding what's the most critical things we need to show t in order to teach effectively. And we iterate and continue to make it better. And with advanced technology like uh, augmented reality or AI or, or just simple, very effective, quick, rapid, rapid fire instructionals, videos. They're very powerful. And also having a development environment like, like the full, o like for example, we use OSC Linux or say Sweet Home, FreeCAD or Cura or, um, that we use for 3D printing or design. It's all in there. It's, you don't have to download a bunch of stuff, which would, could take hours, you know. It would take many, many hours. So you create the environment too. Like you might have Godot the, or uh, Unreal Engine as your development environment. You create development environments which allow you to do that fast. So just like right now, anybody can use a computer. A couple of decades ago, only like top scientists could do that, you know. Right now, everybody can use it because the interface to it is good. So it's about creating interfaces to the technology that are readily accessible and provide the power of gods to average humans, which also means that we need to get the wisdom of gods too in order to make that work.
Yeah, we definitely believe in rapid learning. And you're asking good questions about it. That's right. It's uh, a lot to be done. But we can <laughs> clearly do much better than schools do today, right? <laughs> Did you go to school? Yeah. Are you able to, uh, like, is, tell me more about game development, so the kind of work that you do as a freelancer, uh, is that hard to make a living doing that, or are you particularly good at it, or is that a super competitive field, or there's just a lot of, a lot of revenue in that field? Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 Mhm. Mm so let me just ask you. So, so so you're reinforcing what I just said before. Once you understand the pattern, you can now learn much more rapidly in a new new area. Right, is that kind of reinforcing that? Yeah. Yeah. And is it, is it easy to be, be a game developer or it's super competitive? What did you say, triple A? What's triple A mean?
Oh, okay. Okay, I see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, I thought you might have been referring to <coughs> to the people who fix your car when your wheel pops off on a road. All right, different. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, are you thinking at so with this the skill set you would pick up in an apprenticeship? Are you interested a lot in career shift, or are you pretty much saying, no, we're going to just address this game, indie game community issue of housing? That would be the thing that you continue on game development. How would you see yourself uh, contributing to OSC later on? Is that interesting to you, or into collaborative product development? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or anyone. Your particular application is for artists. Applies to... Yeah, yeah. So you're just saying, yeah, it could be for anybody. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Sounds good. So, do you have any questions about what the program would look like? Uh, there's collaborative design training. There's builds every day. There's the Friday where we work a lot on building infrastructure. Saturdays are global collaboration days where we develop collaborative protocols. We do video production, rapid creation of rapid learning materials. Um, and ways that we can see global collaboration through things like incentive challenges or hackathons. So we work on that on Saturday. And then evenings, two, two, two weeks, two times per week in the evenings, we have the enterprise seminar. And then during later, we have it every day, uh, focusing on the CD go home. Um, yeah, that's kind of the schedule. Let's look at the second question because I think that's the answer to that is absolutely yes. And the answer is absolutely yes for the same reason that we say it's absolutely yes for changing the world. And that is to create infrastructures where you're liberated from so-called making a living. Because everyone focuses on just putting bread on their table and they can't, they're completely compromised. They don't have the, the independence to do what they really need to pursue self-determination and their growth and their true interests. So if you, if you can lower your barriers to, to survival, which by the way is this still, I mean, everyone still is in somewhat of a survival mode where the preoccupation is how do you, how do you make a living? Uh, that should be ridiculously easy if we have appropriate technology. So the answer to your second question is absolutely there's a purpose to that. First question is, is that, rel like, is the skill set that you gain relevant to that? Yeah, I mean, you'd learn how to build a house at low cost. Well, you'd be learning to design and build anything, so you probably, probably don't know all of that stuff. You'd be, but you'd also be primarily learning. So that's the subject matter, but the process is very important. We're teaching you how to think collaboratively, the real skills, the real tools and skills for collaboration, and the bigger vision of kind of like what I was implying here. It's like we got to expand our vision to what's possible, so that what we end up doing in life is much more rich and and constructive to everybody on the planet. 
Uh, so, so it's a lot about if you want to gain this, the, the mindset, it's about cultivating the mindset of open collaboration, problem solving, for thinking about bigger issues than just ourselves, like trying to expand what you do right now to augment that to, um, to a larger scale, just more inclusive kind of a perspective. So I don't think there will be a lot of like redundancy, like like what like technical skill of like where where do you think there would be a redundancy? Well, I can tell you that. Well, I mean, any part of it is going to be only a small part of the of the program because there's so many different elements. And for example, if we're on a team, like if you're the programmer, you already know how to do it. Well, maybe you do the actual, you focus on the build part. The person that doesn't have micro microcontroller experience programming may may want to do that. If you don't want to do that, the whole point is that we're we've got a posse of us working together on all the projects, and we take the roles as as most appropriate based on skill sets and interests. So there would always be an angle to it that you, that you you'd find some innovation in. Like maybe you want to learn how to document or like uh, do video uh, from the stuff that we do um, as part of a particular project. It might be just, oh yeah, I just want to learn the build of it or, or building a machine that helps us automate stuff. So there's a ton of elements around any project that can be improved. So we have the freedom to actually do that um, now the thing about the design sessions in the mornings, they'll be, the design sessions are about, it's primarily about you being able to design just anything. So, so that's like the, I would say the biggest part where we're explaining pretty much all the primitive building blocks of technology, solenoids, shafts, wheels, ball bearings, microcontrollers, you know, mechanical, hydraulics, like we'll go through all these systems. In, in terms of like the components that all technology is made of. Work on part libraries. We already have plenty of part libraries with which we can build things. But a lot of it is how do you understand the primitive elements so that you can design and build anything. So if you want to design a house, you're going to be capable of designing a closed loop water system that pr processes its waste. Or the energy system that provides its electricity or the aquaponics that provides food for that house. It's a highly integrated system with many moving parts. So you will not be, uh, there won't, won't be a lot of redundancy as far as I can see. Yeah, we're talking, yeah. We're learning how to design systems so we can transform the systems. So we're, uh, and the, the bigger picture of transforming the planet is a direct connection to this this work. As I'm saying, if you if you like to consider, okay, now I can expand the the scope of my work to actually work more directly on pressing world issues, the very well identifiable pressing world issues that do exist, then this is a place for you. And you, you've identified one, which is say affordable housing for creatives. That's one. It's completely the same thing as solving housing in general. I mean, if you solve that, then we're solving housing. We're solving it for everybody. Uh, and we'd encourage you the way it would work is like we're encouraging you, okay so think about that you already mentioned the land access issue well how do we address that issue because maybe that's the critical issue that you're really solving for but you didn't even know it um, you will find out um, what solutions emerge to solve all these things collaboratively and so it will be um, unscripted <laughs> it wouldn't be <laughs> too much redundancy in there there's plenty of important issues from the systems perspective that we can work on. Um, yeah. There's nothing like it. In grad school you, you learn to, for example, to typically you learn, uh, if you're at the grad school level, at least if you're in a program like mine, or I've heard from many people that you learn a lot of theoretical stuff that might not exist in the world. We don't care a lot about that in this program. We, we care about tangible solutions to major pressing world issues right now. That was the major frustration I had with my PhD program, uh, where I was work like, I went to a professor once asking about this equation I was studying. He, he told me, oh, this doesn't exist. I just made it up. And it's like, what? Uh, I thought I'm trying to 
solve real problems here. And you get so far out into this very tiny detail that you lose complete sight of, of everything else. That's the typical route, unless you work very hard to not get trapped into that perspective. Um, so one is the hands-on the hands-on mission of actually building things, very practical things. It's about mixing enterprise development into that, as grad school is not about enterprise development. Other major difference is that it's open and collaborative. Grad school is not open and collaborative, even though people might think that. Um, uh, night and day difference, I mean, that's a good question. How is this op different than grad school? You're, um, I would say the number one thing is you're, you're doing everything applied and collaborative towards solving pressing world issues. That's not what you do in grad school. You're getting trained to work for somebody else or go to an institution of higher learning after that or be a teacher. Um, and that's that's valuable, but the pro oh yeah, the, <laughs> the only problem with that is you're just teaching about the same old problems and not really the solutions to get beyond them because you're too much in a system. That's the main difference. <laughs> We're out of the box. That's <laughs> So I'll take my answer back. The out of the box thing is that we're actually talking about because we're structuring ourselves to be independent, independently funded out of the system, we can actually work on real solutions, not promulgating the systems that exist. That's what you get out of grad school. Ah, thanks for, thanks for letting me clarify that because I never said it that way before. Um, yeah. Those are some good questions, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Simple questions, but yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I did. I did most of that. There may be some other people that, if you look at the page history, there might be some person or two that maybe did some additions or something. Uh, I would say freedom, collaborative design, like uh, solving pressing world issues, as in uh, what is the critical, which are most dear to me? Well, um, I would say all of them because I'm ready to solve all of them. Not me, it's me and, the not me, it's the thousands of people that we're going to train and and I don't have to carry the cross of Jesus and do it myself. That's the thing I learned in my collaborative history. I used to think that, oh yeah, I've got this big burden on me. Not anymore since about a few years. Uh, I had a mentor who actually taught me this. But I don't have to, the whole point is, I'm not doing this myself. Um, my biggest deal is to create an environment where all those issues can be solved. And that to me is uh, thousands of open source ecology like campuses worldwide that each have a self-funding mechanism, that they're real functional communities that educate, innovate, and solve pressing world issues. So we're effectively creating a large scale, scalable process for funding regenerative work. How's that sound? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, you said it. That, that's right. Open source, and then we say also on top of that, since we noticed that open, a lot of open source is not highly collaborative because a lot of the open source process is where people go off in a corner and then they publish and then it's open. But we also like to add the open source slash collaborative because in the development process, just publish it as soon as you start it. That's the culture we teach. So when you document on our, your wiki, you have your work log, publish it the first minute you start it. Don't be afraid. So publish early and often, really. Uh, don't go into a corner and then uh, say, oh, now I have enough. No, let people help you throughout the process. And of course, you have to know how to manage that kind of a process in order to make it effective and avoid spam. Like, you know, you gotta learn management and negotiation and, and other skills that uh, enable the openness to actually work, you know. It starts with definitely being able to handle vulnerability, right, that you're opening yourself up for critique and all that. So you have to gain confidence in order to negotiate it. You gotta learn how to 
communicate, how to negotiate, so that both sides always get, like, I read a great book just recently, it's called Never Split the Difference. Both sides need to get what they need. There is no us and, or them. That's a great savior in terms of lots of potential trouble. There is no us or them. That's one thing we believe in. That's That comes out of our mission, which is inclusive. If we believe in inclusivity, that, then we don't believe it's us versus them. We're all in it together. And that that can help solve a lot of problems. Uh, I was referring... Yeah, it doesn't matter, but I was referring specifically to the, the conflicts between groups of people where, oh, they're evil, we gotta kill them. You know, that kind of deal. It's, it's a persistent problem if humanity hasn't transcended yet. It's like, it's us and them. We're going to fight them and uh, create boundaries and so forth. Or the very clear thing about the political schism within this country right now, the polarization, us versus them. No, we got to get beyond that. Um, a lot of people, in order to gain power, they create these artificial schisms. Um, but as individuals, we have to see that no, we're all in it together. We're, we've got similar ideals of being happy, peaceful, and prosperous, and working on self-determination as what makes us human, the drivers of humanity, that's self-determination theory, autonomy, mastery, purpose. We all have that. Why are we making all these uh, divisions? Why are we continuing to believe in artificial scarce that things are scarce when from first principles that is not true there's m way more solar energy that comes to this planet than we can use so that means we can transform natural materials into an abundance of material well-being yet so many people are deprived like 80 percent of the planet are like deprived and starving and all that that's just ridiculous it's uh it's unconscionable and we can fix that overnight if we choose to. That's that's the perspective here. And that's the that's the team we're building. And I think that uh, I really like the, uh, the apprenticeship so far. We've had some pretty good people um, show up to the plate. Um, I think you're also uh, you're expressing some of these these questions, and you are interested in collaborative development. I'm hearing. Uh, your video of interest showed me that you're kind of thinking about making it better, making the life better for other people. That's that's how we think. It's helping out everybody and, and not, not getting trapped into scarcity thinking. Because that's, it's learned, it's all learned. We still, uh, as our psychology, we're like kind of like a hundred thousand years in our psychology where we're, we're uh, we kind of need to update our mental model to to say that no, we've got technology that could that could provide amply for our needs. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid about other people taking our stuff and they're not being enough and all of that. Uh, we need to grow and appreciate that from first principles. That's just not valid. It might have been valid, you know, thousands of years ago when we didn't have tractors and computers. <laughs> I don't know, but at that time there were so few people that shouldn't have been valid anyway but there were like your tigers that would eat you and you kind of had to fend for yourself in the cave but that's certainly not the case today we've got plenty of abundance and capacity to survive and thrive um, but that's very well mal distributed unevenly distributed so the economy has not solved for equi equitable distribution of resources that's the problem we're trying to solve through open source yeah 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 it would be great so i i like where you're at on that i think could definitely be a part of that so 